So welcome to today's webinar. It's the third webinar of the anthology webinar series that we're doing this year. The title is Semantic Annotation of Images in the Fair Data Era. Okay, um, again, just a little intro. Um, we are the Ontology's community of practice. Um, there's different ways to be engaged. Many of you are already engaged in this community. Um, we have a website that is updated with high-level information of events we're participating in and the things that are going on. Um, there is a newly created LinkedIn community, which we will drop in uh, the link in the chat box now. If you are not a part of this community, we encourage you to click the link and join. Um, it is just starting out, but we're using it as an exchange for information, follow up to our webinars, um, and, and it's quite a great interactive place for us to be engaged with you guys um, all year round beyond the webinars. Uh, next is our YouTube channel, which you also get a link for. Um, and that is where we have our two last webinars that we've already conducted this year. Um, this webinar is also being recorded and will be put up on there as well. So you can refer back to it and you can also share it with your colleagues if they were perhaps not able to make it today. Um, and finally, um, we have a, a newsletter um, and you can be a part of that. You can just send us your information, your email, and we can ensure that you are engaged there. So there's four different ways to be engaged and we hope that we can stay in contact beyond the webinars. Um, next, I'm going to hand it over to Elizabeth, who is the leader of the community of practice of Ontologies Group, who's going to welcome everyone and give a brief, brief description of the group and the webinar series. Elizabeth. Thank you, Amma. So yes, welcome to all the people who are connected and thanks particularly to our two speakers who will introduce us to the semantic annotation of images in the fair data era. The ontology community of practice is part of the CGIR big data platform. It's one of the five community of practice and the objective is really to to bring all the community of practice members together for sharing expertise and knowledge and also find some uh, answers to the question we have in common on how to use ontologies at best and in order to address the topics that have been uh, identified by members as priority during uh, the past uh, conventions we held, uh, we decided to launch this webinar series so each topic has been identified by the members themselves and we hope this will be creating a series of uh, resource material that you can always consult and share with your colleagues and then the idea of uh, promoting the ontologies is really to help all data managers to describe at best uh, their data sets add quality and then publish in repositories uh, like Dataverse, Guardian, or any database, and make them of quality for reuse. So we are looking forward to the, the content of this uh, webinar by uh, Justine and uh, Pierluigi, and I wish you all a, a very instructive webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay, and now just a brief introduction. We have two panelists, as mentioned. Um, we are very excited to have them join us today. We have Justin Priest, Senior Faculty Research Assistant from Oregon State University, who woke up really early this morning to join us, so we are very thankful for that. Um, and we have Pierluigi Boutieg, um, Data Scientist from Alfred Wegener Institute, who's actually on the other side of the planet um, in Japan um, and stayed up late and is also joining us, and we're very thankful for him. Um, now we're going to go and I'm going to hand it over to Justin Priest, who has his presentation on automating image annotation. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the invitation to speak today. I really appreciate it, uh, especially to Bioversity and CGIAR for having me on. And uh, as I was introduced, I'm a faculty research assistant in Pankaj Jaiswal's lab at Oregon State University. Uh, and one of the projects that I had the good fortune to be involved with is the Plantium project. Uh, today I'm going to be talking a bit about how ontologies uh, are intersecting with our work in image analysis and annotation and how we can more effectively uh, explore the relationship between those two areas of research. Uh, a lot of this talk will be focused on image annotation uh, and then I will be connecting it into the ontology work and talking a bit more about how we can connect those more deeply as we move forward with our, with our research. 
the Plantium project, just for a review, for those of you who may not be familiar, uh, is focused on ontologies, annotations, and analysis that can be conducted with those. Uh, it, it hosts reference ontologies and provides a platform for integrative uh, plant genomics. There's a network of ontologies that annotate plant traits and phenotypes, expression, et cetera, and uh, is focused on a wide range of plant species, especially agriculturally focused species and model organisms. Uh, you see on your screen uh, some charts showing how different ontologies interrelate. Uh, we host reflections of some of these, and then those, uh, particularly in, in yellow, are areas where we're actively involved in ontology uh, definition and uh, creation uh, within the community, just to orient you a bit. Now, as part of this project, one area is looking at image annotation and how that can be connected to the good ontology work within the plant community. Uh, so this particular project that involves a platform called BISC uh, had the goal of creating a community platform for semantic classification of plant images. Uh, obviously, if you want to classify plant images, a good place to go in order to have consistent classification and shared terminology uh, is to work with the ontology community. Uh, so we were immediately interested in finding ways that we could use ontology terms to associate with our classified imagery. Uh, the platform we chose to work on was the BISC platform that I mentioned. Uh, that was developed at UC Santa Barbara uh, in conjunction with the Cybers project. And it's an online image analysis and storage uh, platform where you can upload your own images uh, in your private account or make them public. Uh, and as you put them there, it also provides a application and modular application space where people can upload image analysis modules and then run those modules on their particular images. So it allowed us to both have a place to store our images as we worked on this new research area, as well as a place to put our software functionality as we wanted to work on uh, doing that image analysis and classification. What we did is we built our own custom module uh, taking advantage of their unique modular architecture on the BIS platform, we wanted to focus in on image segmentation and then classification using machine learning techniques. Uh, we wanted to accept user contributed images and then allow them if they wanted to, to mark up those images with foreground and background marks. In this case, you'll see here in green and blue on the right hand side to denote to our module, the application, which areas of the image they were most interested in segmenting. Now, I should mention the segmentation step of our module is optional. Uh, this is not something that uh, is required, but it allows you to focus in on a particular area of the image. It was also a place where we had started uh, our earlier research, and then we brought in the classification uh, element alongside that. Then the next step, which is uh, the non-optional part of the module, is the classification itself. Uh, once the image is processed on the basis of that user markup, then it returns an optional segment in my image of the orange and the flowers on the right-hand side. You see how it's segmented the orange that I highlighted with foreground interest and returned that value to me. Now that's a separate graphical object at this point. And then what I do in the module is I provide a set of parameters uh, regarding how I would like it to try to infer what it is seeing in the image. So we worked with a public data bank of 5,000 images broken into five separate classes initially, uh, including fruits and flowers, leaves, whole plants, etc. cetera. Uh, and using that information, we uh, trained a model on which we could conduct, with which we could conduct machine learning and try to predict what we saw in other future images. So with that model in place, in this particular case, we went and classified this segmented orange out of this image and then asked it, what do you see, uh, Mr. And, or Ms. Trained model? Uh, do you see a fruit? And as the case happens to be, yes, it does see a fruit. And we started the ontology integration process by associating the terms that it uh, associated with its classes in the machine learning model uh, with ontology terms. So we set it up against the, the term for fruit with the accession ID and a link off to the Plantium browser so uh, people could explore the ontology further uh, on the basis of what was discovered in the image. So again, uh, from the beginning to the end, user uploads an image, 
they segment a portion of the image or they ask it to classify the entire image, that's okay too. Uh, the classification system looks at it and determines what it thinks it's looking at and returns that result. Now we started with a pretty simple model uh, and I should actually mention here first, after this link is provided with the ontology uh, accession at the bottom, that is live link and from the module itself on the BIS platform, you can hop off and go over to the Plantium site to look at that ontology term and the other areas of interest on Plantium site. Perhaps you want to look at the nearest neighbors, uh, siblings, children, parent terms. Uh, those are available. You can look at them graphically or in an bird tree view. And then Plantium also provides lots of annotations that are uploaded from various research communities. For example, in this case, I just had uh, a bunch of grape annotations associated with fruit. So it shows how a user could move from image classification to further data exploration on the Plantium platform on the basis of that ontology integration. So simple classification was a good start and we were excited to be able to tell the difference between a fruit uh, and a flower, but we wanted to start pushing uh, machine learning as that field developed and see if we could get more precise classification. So we decided to focus in on leaf traits uh, as an area where there would be more precision required to differentiate between different leaves. And we produced more uh, training data for this by setting up a little desktop application where we uh, asked for volunteers inside and outside of our lab to quickly annotate or tag uh, about a thousand leaf images with some uh, terminology that would be associated with aspects of the leaf, like the shape of the tip, the shape of the base, the nature of the margin of the leaf, whether it uh, was crenulated edges or a dentate edge, uh, and took advantage of many of the classical terms associated with uh, leaf traits. Now, to point out here, this is an area of great interest to ontologists because uh, we started with the classical identification terminology for leaves. And these were not necessarily connected up to ontology terms. But as we set up our little desktop annotation tool, we figured out, uh, we started to map these terms to the available terms in the plant ontology and in Peto and other locations. And uh, then if the terms weren't available in various ontologies yet, we started the request process to get those terms uh, put in so that they could be used. Obviously, we want to use consistent terminology. So uh, that was the direction we headed. But for the purpose of machine learning classification, we ended up with a thousand leaf images and trained a new model so that we could look at the predictive power of looking at leaf traits when we went back to our BIS platform and attempted to classify leaf elements. So quickly to go back to the BIS platform, here's an image of the module. Uh, and you can see how I have marked up in the foreground of this somewhat chaotic image of mini leaves. I said, I'm interested in this leaf. Here's my foreground in green. Here's my background in blue to help tell the uh, segmentation program what to ignore. Again, I don't have to segment. I could have asked it to look at the entire image, but for the purposes of the demonstration, I did. And then it returns uh, a segment attempt, a segmentation attempt on the basis of the markup I provided. You see that it's not uh, perfectly precise, pixel precise around the edges of what of my area of interest, but I can control that with a uh, segmentation quality slider. Depending on the amount of time I want it to take, I can ask it to be more or less precise. Uh, and then it returns a classification summary which as we discovered with the more uh, detailed work, sometimes you get more or less accurate hits. Like I could quibble with some of uh, the results that it's returning on the nature of the leaf shape, for example, or the base, uh, but I was excited that it could identify the serrated edge or the fact that the venation was reticulate. Uh, so that's work ongoing. Uh, and uh, as with most machine learning systems, the more uh, annotated data you start with, the better off you are. And I would also highlight that these are associated with ontology terms where available, and then we have requested other terms that we need. Uh, I also wanted to point out that we, uh, you can access all of the module generated classification and segmentation data after the fact on the BIS platform. And this is one of the exciting things, all the metadata is stored and you can come back to it. So, you know, these particular two segmentations were from two different runs on this image of orange and orange flowers but the information is stored in the metadata and I can look at them side by side or turn layers on and off. And I can also look at other annotations. I'd like you to remember, hey, there's a place to put annotations of various kinds that'll come in handy in a moment. Uh, let me show how this works in uh, a real world scenario. 
I'm going to go ahead and kick over to my desktop. And here's the BISC platform itself. Uh, I've logged in. This is a, a local development instance we have on some of our servers here at Oregon State. Uh, and just to orient you quickly, it's a sort of a standard online data bank approach. As a user, I've logged in and then it pulls up images that I've been working with recently under the images tab. I could select those and I could simply view those in the image viewer, or I could do some analysis. Under the analyze, there's a drop down. Let's say on the live piece of site provided by uh, Cybers, many other modules, image analysis modules provided in this area. Since we're running a local dev instance, it just has our module loaded up. Uh, so I'm going to select the module that I've been talking a lot about. I'm go go ahead and let that module load up. And so now I'm on the entry form uh, for the uh, pre-processing of the data. So to walk through a live version of the process we we're just talking about, I'll select that orange image, and then uh, on this screen. I can select a markup options. I would like to mark the foreground. So I'm going to say I'm interested in this orange right here. And I'm going to select background and I'm going to mark up the area around it. I don't have to be too precise typically. I just want to tell it what to ignore. And then I set some parameters. I'll say I want to look at simple classification. Yes, I'm just interested in fruits versus flowers, et cetera. Do I want it to segment and or focus? Uh, sorry, do I want it to segment the image? Yes, quality is okay. Do I want to classify the segmented image or the entire thing? Yes, I want it to just look at my segment. A couple of other settings that I won't go into the details of today. And then I run the algorithm and it's processing right now. Uh, it makes a round trip to the server to uh, compare this image against the uh, available model that it has. And it's processing. All right, we'll see if that comes back. Uh, in the meantime, um, I can take you over to um, other processed results uh, to show when a result does come back, like a, a leaf sample I ran before we started the webinar today. Uh, it says the module returned results in about eight seconds for markup on a leaf image, and then it provided the predictive values at the bottom right there. Back and this is the excitement of live demos. There we go. So it did the analysis, returned the results, and it showed with a simple classification, yes, I can identify your markup for that orange. Yes, I can tell you that this is a fruit. This live, this link is live, so I can click off and it'll take me over to Plantium where I can explore the fruit ontology term and associated annotations uh, on that platform. Uh, so that's one example. And then if I wanted to, I could select another image. I'll use something different. Um, here's a compound leaf example. Uh, and I could mark this up. Say I'm interested in this guy over here. I'm going to isolate him from all of the other surrounding leaves. So just mark some background. Say just focus in on this. And this time I'm going to change my classification to leaf classification. So now we're actually switching models. It's looking at a different model. Yes, I want you to do a graph cut. Yes, classify just the segment. It runs that. And we'll see if this result comes back in a timely manner. And it did. And just on the basis of the markup, I provided pretty accurate segmentation in terms of cutting it out. And then it shows the ontology terms it provided. In this particular case, it said, oh, you are a simple leaf. Well, that's true because I asked it to look at one as opposed to compound uh, oblong. It suggests that the base is cuneate. You could, uh, I am not a botanist, but I believe that is a cuneate attachment to that stem. Uh, and it says the uh, tip of the leaf is acute. I could quibble with that. You might have an acuminate little tip there. Uh, and, and then reticulate the nation. Um, so that gives you an idea of how the system works. And as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, you can go and look at the metadata on any image. I could go back and load up an image, and then I can take a look at the history of its graphical annotations. I can even turn those on and off. It shows you how I'd annotated flowers separately uh, in a different run. Uh, and you can accumulate information here. Uh, and there are other areas for adding annotations. And one of the exciting things uh, that we are moving into next is looking at how to more closely integrate the ontology work with this platform. Uh, 
you've seen how we're just associating our classification results with ontology terms. Uh, ultimately, that's not semantically sophisticated at all. Uh, we just said, these are the labels that I want you to use. Uh, I think most people on this uh, particular webinar are aware that we want to focus on issues of semantic inference and the ability to uh, navigate uh, ontological graphs to make associations across those relationships. So to move in that direction, we need to be storing this ontology information in the metadata. So the results you just saw, we're working towards adding uh, accession IDs uh, and term names into the annotation metadata so that as people provide annotations or the classification machine learning provides them or returns those results, that those are available and get stored in the metadata. Uh, in BISC, the, that particular group at Santa Barbara was already working on providing query interfaces for uh, looking at the metadata associated with annotated images, and that can include ontology terms, which would allow us to do uh, more sophisticated semantic inference. You could do broader sort of, uh, network searches. You could look at sibling and cousin relationships or move up a superclass or down a subclass uh, based on the information that's available for uh, the images you're looking at. So that's the direction we're headed. And speaking of improved machine learning, I just want to say, obviously, I'm working with still images, but the machine learning community is moving forward very rapidly. Uh, so it will not be long before we're trying to do this similar kind of work on uh, video as well. Here's an example of some work in a collaborator's lab where they loaded up uh, corn cobs, rotated them, captured that on video, and then applied machine learning to look at fluorescent kernels under light uh, on those cows of maize and in real time or near real time identify where the fluorescent kernels are on the image. Now it's just using the word fluorescent here, but you can easily imagine that that could be the appropriate ontology term that's being associated with the. And as that metadata is stored with, as a result of this analysis, then you have a connection into semantic inference for future use. Lastly, uh, another example, you've got um, a conveyor belt where you can look at seeds and it's separating differences between two different kinds of seeds, fescue and clover. Uh, and as the seeds come onto the screen, it immediately is able to pick up and differentiate between the two with a high degree of precision. And with that, uh, I would just like to say thank you to some critical people. Uh, Dimitri Chigakis, who's now a researcher at the University of Crete, uh, he did uh, a large chunk of the software development on this project. Um, and our leaf annotations in-house in our lab, Pankage, uh, supervising PI on the project, and uh, Justin Elser, who uh, maintained the platform that hosts the BISC. Uh, the folks over at Cybers and BISC that provide the underlying platform that allow us to build our module, and uh, the videos you saw on the last screen are from the work of Dan Curry's lab in the Seed Services uh, area at Oregon State, and John Fowler's lab with his PhD student, Matthew Warman, and Chris Sullivan as well in the uh, CGRB, uh, he's the assistant director for biocomputing there, and they're talented students. So lots of cool work going on in this field, and I uh, hope you've enjoyed uh, looking at some of that, and I'm going to hand it back. Um, thank you very much, Justin. Um, that was a really interesting presentation. Um, and now we will present um, Pierre-Louis Boutier. Um, he's a data scientist from Alfred Wegener Institute, Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, this presentation is just a little bit of a high-level perspective on, again, why it's probably an interesting thing to do and useful to use ontologies for your tags and to actually go through the um, effort and sometimes one has to admit pain of um, working with the ontology community to really represent the things you need represent. Not that they're painful to work with, it's just the subject matter is pretty tough. So I like to think of using ontologies to tag as deep tagging. Um, it's, it's enriching that tag with content that machines can use to take it far beyond a string and far beyond just trying to do string matching um, and leverage that to allow you to do new kinds of data analysis. Um, I'm putting um, two hats on today. So one is the co-chair of the um, ESIP semantic tech community. So the uh, ESIP is the Earth Science Information Partners, and also NOAA USGS as founders, and we deal with Earth Science Semantics. And I'm also on the Operations Committee of the Oboe Foundry for more biomedical and biological ontologies. The two uh, ontologies that I primarily develop are the SDG interface ontology with the UN, with UN environment for uh, the SDGs, 
and ENVO, uh, an ontology of environments. So it's a little bit of distant from plants, but we do interact with the plant ontology teams to do contextualization of plant environments. So right. this fits into this whole idea of fair, fair data. Um, most of you, I, I, I would imagine, have heard of this by now, think that data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And let's take a deep dive into what interoperability means in this context of FAIR. So interoperability um, is pretty precisely defined. Uh, and actually, one of the key parts is this idea of using a language of knowledge representation in order to be able to make your data interoperable and to use vocabularies that follow themse that themselves follow the FAIR principle so that they're web available and online and all of that. And that knowledge representation is the theme that's of the rest of this presentation. So what is this knowledge representation idea? So most of you have heard of machine learning, and we've seen some of that right now. And that's a branch of AI that deals with, deals with having data to train things like classifiers. But there's another branch, a large branch of AI, um, which is uh, knowledge representation. Knowledge representation is really about trying to directly transfer expert knowledge into a machine-readable form, even when you don't have the data to support it, uh, if it's rare knowledge or if it's uh, you know just brand new and you don't have a lot of data, um, and a way for machines to interact with that. It kind of fits on, ontologies fit on a gradient, uh, so the so-called semantic gradient, we start with things like vocabularies or just text strings that are controlled so that uh, at, least, at least there's some sort of syntactic order. And you progress up to ontologies which give you more expressivity. So that and when we say expressivity, it's not just for humans. It's also for machine agents. Machines would then un kind of understand what you're trying to say. So that's what it is in a nutshell. It's a machine-readable and human-readable logical representation of knowledge about stuff in the world. And that machine readability is the key. Um, the ontology is often broadly used, but at least when, when we as ontology developers and engineers use that term, we always have in mind the ability of machines to act on an ontology and to come up with uh, um, some sort of inferences and reason over it. Uh, so a little bit of what uh, um, was shown in the previous uh, talk. So that's it. So it's an, I think you can kind of conceptualize it as a web of knowledge. And in that web, you have nodes or connect, um, the, the entities what the, of what that knowledge is about. And those entities are connected by machine-readable logical relationships. So a machine agent, like an AI agent, knows how to navigate through that web of knowledge. It knows how those nodes are related to each other. Very importantly, each one of those nodes is web available, and each one of those relationships are also defined on the web. So a machine agent or a human can put in a URL and then go online to figure out what the thing is and then talk to other things that are connected by other URLs. So this is the whole idea of web available linked, da uh, linked knowledge to help uh, data applications or tagging applications. Right, so here's an example. Um, so this is an environment example. Uh, there you see a volcanic eruption. One can imagine tagging that up. Um, and there are ways to understand what that tag actually means. We can have a string, a simple string like volcanic eruption, and uh, that's, that's great. It gives us some information. But if you, again, link it to one of those nodes in that knowledge web that's represented by an ontology or has, has been captured by an ontology, in this case, the environment ontology, let's see what happens. So it takes, you, it takes you on the web and it takes you to something like a volcanic eruption process, but that's interlinked with other nodes on that knowledge web, not just from one ontology, but from others too. It helps the machine understand that those processes have certain chemicals as outputs, that they involve different parts of the planet, that they um, eject different kinds of materials like lava and tephra, that they mobilize magma. And here you can see ENVO, but it also interoperates with other ontologies like the Chemical Entities of Biological Interest ontology and the Quality ontology that we've seen in the previous presentation. And that's really key too. An ontology, an ontology that kind of exists in its own silo, um, it may be very well formed, but it, it won't necessarily do as much because they themselves should also be interoperable with other ontologies. So that's an example from Earth Science. Now, uh, the, the example that uh, Justin showed previously, let's take a walk through that. So he already, he already uh, pointed to two things, like for example, the plant ontology identifier for leaf and the PEDO, or the quality or trade ontology, quality ontology um, class for serrated as a quality of that leaf. So let's draw it out in these, uh, these little wire diagrams. And these wire diagrams are, are representations for us of what the machine sees in the logic. So they're not just uh, pictures that I draw, they're actually reflecting the ontology content. So there we have it. That, that's when, when, when Justin points to leaf, uh, the plant ontology understands 
that indeed it is a plant structure, it's a plant organ, it's a phylum, and a serrated leaf, uh, that connects to that whole uh, knowledge, that knowledge representation that's in Pato. So it understands it's a quality of things, a, qu a quality of physical objects, it's a morphology quality, etc. And that connects, again, those ontologies import one another, and if you imported them all together, you could make your solution understand that those entities, leaves and certain qualities, are connected to environmental entities like leaf litter. And they're all talking to each other. Um, and this doesn't necessarily mean that the leaf you're looking at is part of leaf litter, but it just shows that the ontology has a reference layer. So if you have data, if you had an image with leaf litter in the background and you trained it, and uh, you could leave it to the ontology to play with your probabilities there and say, well, you know, semantically it's likely that this thing is related, plus I have some image data that I've trained, so I'm gonna boost my signals a little bit. So it's not just a reference system. You can actually actively use that to change your probability space if you need to. Um, and as Justin said very well, talk to the ontology developers. If it's not working for you, or if the ontology is not fit for purpose in that particular application, state what that is. Um, and most of the ontologies that are out there will either create new content or invite you to be a co-editor if you have training, uh, if, you, if, you're, if you have people to train or if you'd like to learn yourself. These are community projects, all of the ones shown here. Right, so that's a, in a nutshell, that's it. So, you know, data, data is about getting sens sensory bits of information that come out. And it becomes information when um, it mobilizes human knowledge, when we qualify it a little bit such that our brains react. Um, but that is still information, even if it's in a knowledge base, it's information until a human brain acts on it. And with an ontology, um, you're trying to take that knowledge out of people's head, merge it together. Here you should see two different kinds of stakeholders with different knowledge, but you can merge that together. Maybe they'll never meet each other, but you can leverage the ontology, uh, the knowledge that's been captured in an ontology to have a kind of cybernetic uh, enhancement. This is very sci-fi, but it, uh, frankly it is. You have a kind of cybernetic enhancement of your own knowledge or your own community's knowledge with others. Again, you have to curate that a little bit. It's not just a magic thing that works. It's a tool. You curate it a little bit, make sure it fits your, um, your application, and then you proceed. So that's it in a nutshell. Right, and this is just the perspective. So we showed Envo, Plant Ontology, Kebi, others, but there are many more of these interoperating, on, interoperating ontologies that also connect to things like the UN SDGs and the development processes, biological processes, chemicals. Um, we do work certainly with the CGIAR, who um, support this webinar series, as you know, to work on agronomy ontologies and also collaborate with people developing food ontologies. And all of these things are forming, they're evolving, and that means when you tag something, your tag isn't static. Your tag is pointing to a, an evolving and ever refining web of knowledge. So come back you know, in a few years, and it's likely that you can then have a new analysis with legacy data, legacy tags. And that's quite exciting. You know, The thing is working for you in the background. And of course, all of these are version controlled. So if you want to recreate your analysis from like five years ago, you can roll back those ontologies to their previous state and do the same thing. So that's what I mean by deep tagging. So remember that, again, just because something's called an ontology, just because it's an OWL or RDF or any one of these new, well, not, not, they're not new, but any one of these technologies, doesn't necessarily mean the thing is good. You have to do some due diligence and check that the thing is working, that it's accepted in the community, that people use it, and it's quality controlled. It's the same thing as saying, you know, just because I code an R, I'm a stat statistical genius, right? We know, we know that's not true. So just be aware of that. Um, I would just like to emphasize the last point of this, uh, of these points, that remember that you can shape it. Justin showed how uh, their community could indeed ask it. They have the um, advantage of actually working very closely with ontologists, but you don't need to. You can put your requirements on the issue trackers in GitHub that are associated with most of these ontologies. If it's urgent, it can be responded. If you have the funding and capacity, um, you, your people can certainly be trained. There are many ontology uh, developers and editors are willing to do that. And you know, let's all sort of build this machine brain together and get to the stage where we have the Starship Enterprise answering questions that we ask it. All right, that's it. Thank you very much for your time. One more just for acknowledgements, and there are too many people to acknowledge, so you'll see a flurry of logos. Um, and I welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pierre Luigi. Um, we are now going to transition to the question, answer, and comments. Why don't we go ahead and start with Elizabeth? Thank you both for the very uh, instructive presentations. So Justin, you took example of a leaf shape. I was wondering if you had already consideration or 
if we could envision to use the, the BIS system you showed us to also identify uh, forms of leave that are un unusual or are um, uh, apparently the result of disease symptoms. And if you already had the, some consideration for that, what would we need in your system to be able to, to do that? Thank you, that's a really good question. Uh, Yes, uh, we are very interested in creating a set of training data that's focused on leaf disease. It's a natural progression from what we're looking at right now. Uh, and there's already a, a developing body of work in the disease ontology area for botany specifically that we can take advantage of. In terms of uh, where the technology is with um, machine learning and looking at uh, images to be able to identify uh, disease elements it is very much ready for that. Uh, the starting place for all this, as I discussed in my presentation, uh, is having uh, a robust enough set of training data in order to develop an effective model. Uh, that, that part of the process uh, can be sped up uh, now with bootstrapping techniques where you start with a smaller set of annotated data. Say, for example, uh, if we had uh, a set of 100, 200, 300 images of leaves with stripe rust, for example, or some other kind of spotting or a fungal infection, uh, where you have visual features that appear on the leaf, uh, then you could tag that smaller set of data using a desktop tool like what I described earlier to speed that process up uh, or, um, or some approximate form of that, and then take that data, train on it, and initially you'd have a lower predictive power in the results uh, with a smaller set of training data. But you can actually use those results to feed back into the same system uh, and I've also, uh, we, we have experimented with some semi-supervised learning techniques where you uh, annotate a set of data and then you just duplicate the images that you have with some minor frame shift or orientation shift and uh, are able to make a multiplicative use of already annotated data to improve your predictive power. Um, so the short answer is, Yes, it makes total sense uh, for diseases that have a visual presentation. Uh, and I know that there's work on going in the ontology community to identify plant disease elements. So, uh, yeah, that is an exciting direction. I think we should head very quickly. Uh, I am muted. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you, uh, Justine. Uh, and my follow up question would be. Um, uh, if, if our community would like to, to use the system you, you demonstrated or contribute some photos or images we have, particularly because our, our community is working on uh, crops, we also have people working on livestock, etc. But cook, how can we collaborate or how can we use your system? Well, let's start with uh, contacting uh, the Plantium group. Uh, and if somebody in the community has uh, plant images uh, of interest and have an analysis idea that they'd like to pursue, if they get in touch with Plantium, they can go to plantium.org uh, and uh, contact us there. Then we'll get in touch with them and we can discuss uh, what they're interested in pursuing. Uh, that would be that would be the starting place. Uh, as far as the availability of the platform, I was showing uh, our module loaded up on a BISC system uh, on a local development environment here at Oregon State, but we have been working with Cybers to put the module into uh, their public BISC repository. Uh, we've not published our module there yet uh, with them, but uh, we've worked with them on some of the infrastructure challenges, and uh, I'm hoping that in the near future have a publicly available version. Obviously, um, I didn't go into much of this in my talk, but the power of providing a system like this and a public data storage uh, center where uh, metadata can be added and accreted over time is that you have people come in from the user community, add their own images, uh, tag that data, uh, and then uh, 
the underlying system that we use to uh, train our models on can take advantage of user contributed tag data. So as people bring images to the platform once publicly available, then uh, we're building our training set. Uh, that's part of uh, the goal, the direction we want to head in uh, so that the community can help itself over time. Um, but I would say uh, start by contacting the Plenium project and then we can discuss. The, so for, uh, if we ask for collaboration, and it's about uh, uh, a domain you don't have yet an ontology on, shall we hmm. uh, work with you to identify the best ontology to use and bring our control vocabulary? Uh, absolutely. I think that uh, the, uh, the collaborators within this particular uh, area of ontology development know each other pretty well, and they're all very enthusiastic about uh, creating integrations between uh, the ontologies, like Pierre Luigi showed on his slides. Uh, the power of semantic inference uh, is exponential when you start to connect up multiple ontologies. Uh, and while the planium may only have grant-based authority for a few ontologies, they're certainly collaborating and working with uh, people who are developing ontologies in other areas. Uh, and uh, even if those terms aren't available or if the planium project doesn't control the appropriate ontology, they work with the people who do. <laughs> and uh, and we're all in academic research so that we can benefit from each other's work. That's the whole point of it. So I'm sure that uh, the community uh, can create the uh, necessary collaborative connections to build build ontology terms where they're needed. Right, now I'll just chime in on that. Um, so uh, most of these ontologies are CC BY or CC0, and you can certainly branch them off and try to draft what you need locally. You don't need to build up another ontology if you can't afford the overhead in terms of time. But if it works, if it really works well, then we really encourage you to push that back to the community and create a new domain ontology for others to use and benefit from. Um, that's great. And just a, just a perspective, so the agronomy ontology uh, and the food ontology, they both came out of ENVO. So they, um, ENVO had some classes for food, ENVO had some classes for um, agronomic uh, entities. And then communities approached us and said, hey, look, we really need that developed. And we said, well, we don't have the capacity, but we'll train you into running your own ontologies and show you how it's done. And now they're fully fledged ontologies. They're refining. You know, they're, they're always things to iron out. But um, that's, that's really the multiplicative effect. That's really that, uh, that momentum that we want to build and give as much of the stuff away to the, the right people with the right expertise, the right connections, and spread around the training. Mm -hmm. Um, thank, you. thank you very much. Thanks, Elizabeth, for your good questions, and um, Justin also for the response and how we can continue to collaborate. Um, I see that there's another question uh, from Jesus Herrera. Yeah, my question is, do your ontologies uh, follow any standards so that they can be understood by a wide range of machines and then be able to provide semantic information? Um, I, I'll, I'll, I guess that's that's directed towards me. Um, I put a link in the um, chat to that links to the Oboe Foundry. So that's really the community within which most of these ontologies are developed. Now that's not to say that's the only community, but it is one of them. And one of the things that I think makes it special, and one of the reasons that I, I developed there, is because they have a set of guiding principles um, for all of those ontologies. Um, that's important in the sense of, let's say, standard practices, and there are also lots of calls, and people uh, talk to each other and guide each other, and also we complain at each other all the time that, you know, hey, look, your ontology's not working here, I can't use it. And that's healthy. It, it helps us refine it. It's, it's pretty collegial. Um, so that, that's, to answer your question, yes, some communities do, some don't. And that's that sort of vetting process that I, I referred to. I think it's worth checking out that, that there is some kind of community that has those standards and best practices for ontology development. Um, so that's 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 certainly the short answer there. Yeah, that's uh, good news. Is that sufficient? I mean, yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, it's really good news. In the past, uh, this uh, doesn't happen very frequently. And uh, regarding fair principles, I guess uh, that's a good move. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's that's been the that's been the sort of um, the modus operandi of that community for a very long time, long before I joined, and it's it's what made the quality solid enough to build stuff on top of it in the first place, um, which which I think is quite important. And again, the the kind of stakeholders that we interact with, at least in Envo, 
um, whenever they need something to work, they do talk to us to make sure that it can it can indeed work. And at least I also have the, as a developer, I also have the sort of security of knowing that if I can't continue for that with that project for some reason, it doesn't stop. The, the users also have that security of knowing that because um, other people in that community, the, the foundry and the li library, are trained in operating an ontology like Envo. So it's not going to be lost simply because the main developer is gone. People can pick it up and, and work on. In fact, a lot of my time is training other people in how to do that. Again, the philosophy of just give it away so it grows. Very, very important. Okay, so well, well keeping the quality, of course. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just going to chime in and, and provide a corollary answer to say that certainly the the project that I work on, we work with the Oboe Foundry uh, directly. Uh, we have constituent ontologies. Uh, we're very concerned about being in the center of wherever the community is on those standards. We follow those formats and uh, we are we live in those circles. So, yes. Thank you again. Great. Sure, thank, thank, you. You. thank you for your question, Jesus, and thank you for the great answers. Um, and, and also for the link, uh, links, Pierre and Justin, we see those um, below in the chat box. Um, we have another question from Elizabeth. Did you want to answer? Do you want to ask it? Yeah, thank you, Amal. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, this is for Pierre Luigi and uh, Justin. Uh, following uh, your presentations, uh, do you feel that um, the system you presented, Justin, is producing fair images as per the definition that Luigi gave? Uh, if yes, it's great. If not, what is missing? Uh, the question can be shared by both of you. Thank you. Uh, sure, I can start if that's okay, Pierre. Um, yeah, sure. I would sure say, I would say uh, but you know, it's... Uh, the uh, I would say broadly, uh, yes. The the data that I was using in my examples today, for example. Uh, uh, for the simple classification training set are sourced from a publicly available project called ImageClef, and that data is published and disseminated widely and intentionally. Um, I'll, after my answer here, I'll go fish for the link and put it in the chat. People can see where that is. For findable and accessible, definitely. Um, and also uh, some of the other sample images I used today, uh, just for fun, I, you know, I, I, uh, I like to live on the edge. I try to grab the images I'm showing you for uh, the segmentation classification examples. I try to pull those from publicly available image data sources uh, and uh, it, it tests the robustness of our platform because it's not just our own in-house data, right? Uh, so that orange and orange blossom example, that's just available from Wikimedia. And I think I had the citation on the slide for that. So trying to follow those principles ourselves. Uh, as far as in interoperability and reusability goes, I think interoperability goes back to the discussion we we're just having about uh, working within the community of standards in ontology development and inference. Uh, uh, we're uh, right in the heart of that effort, making our uh, our data, our ontologies available in OBO or and OWL, uh, for example, uh, and reusable. That's why we're putting them in publicly available uh, databases. That's uh, the whole point. So uh, for our own efforts, uh, that that's what we're trying to do to meet those standards. Uh, if that's the if that's where your question was pointed to. Great, Pierre Luigi. Did you have anything to add on that? Hmm. Uh, so I'm, I'm certainly not an image analysis expert, but that sounds, you know, that's making them findable, it's making them accessible, they're online. And the interoperability as far as the way it's defined in FAIR currently, um, that's that's there. You know, they are using the, so when you're using an ontology, for the moment you're using one of the most expressive ways of allowing machines to discover your data, your images in this case, and uh, act on them. Know which other images are closely related. It'll help people pool data, pull it, reanalyze, re etc. So it's it seems you know as far as I can see, it looks it looks pretty good. But then again, of course, you know Justin is over there, right, looking at me. Um, but I wouldn't say anything bad, even though I'm in Japan and there's no way he can catch me. But we'll probably meet at some point. <laughs> I was muted, but I was laughing. <laughs> Here, I posted a link in to the image cleft data. Uh, people can check it out for themselves. Uh, it's not from the plant community. One of the cool things about working this space is that that data was culled uh, for image analysis purposes within the computer vision research community. So it just shows 
the power of ontologies in our space to really help us communicate with very disparate research groups. That's really cool. So like in marine microbiology where I operate, you know, there's a lot of image analysis happening with uh, especially lo larger eukaryotes, diatoms, uh, dinoflagellates, etc. Small, microscopic, mm -hmm. but still large enough to photograph. And they're doing very similar things and beginning to use ontologies. And then imagine like you really, really cross-linking all of these images and saying, hey, look, what happens to biodiversity when a volcano, volcano erupts in the vicinity? And who has image data about that? A query system to pull that out, that's the future. Agreed, and I'm excited that we seem to be drawing ever closer to a time where uh, we can really get after the promise of semantic inference as this body of underlying standardized data develops. I, I think of it, uh, it may not be the best analogy, but I think of it uh, similarly to how successful search has been uh, as a generalized internet functionality. It started really with a body of available data and having that data be accessible and findable, as in the FAIR acronym. Uh, and once all of that was in place, then people were able to, to target that data with their algorithms. We've been talking about semantic power of ontologies for you know a long time now, decade plus, uh, but it's, it takes a while to develop both the network of terms uh, as well as tagging enough data to show effective use. And I really feel like we're at a tipping point now where we're going to see ever more examples of there's just there's data out there and somebody went and did something creative with it uh, and are able to show that they actually performed true semantic inference over publicly available data. So I'm excited about that too. Great, thank you, you guys. Um, and in the meantime, um, Justin and Pierluigi, did you have anything additional that you wanted to add that perhaps you didn't have time to convey during your presentation or that you think would be important to convey to the community that's listening and that will listen in the future also when this is listened again in the recording? Um, I, I would make one brief comment uh, that we had in a previous research cycle an earlier desktop-based application that was also working with ontological annotation of images. And that was that particular application was already more tightly integrated to <clears throat> available ontology data. We'd actually set up a web service. Uh, yeah, I can share screen super quickly. We had set up on the previous application uh, services to where uh, other people developing applications could access the, the ontology data that we our, our group provides uh, programmatically, uh, and we use that in that desktop application to have to allow people to like select any ontology term of interest from what was being hosted behind that web service. Uh, we're still implementing that technology on the newer platforms that we're working on, but I want to point out that the APIs are already available. So from the planium.org site, you can actually take advantage of the Amigo RESTful service that the that Plantium is built on and go and request and search for terms by accession ID or by uh, partial term search and get uh, results back in a structured JSON format that will allow you to interact with it programmatically. So that's available and we're going to be using this ourselves as we integrate our current image uh, machine learning technology more tightly on the BISC platform. Final thing from my side, I would just say that when you look at an ontology and you see a part of it that just will not work for you, like, you know, you know the stuff there and it's like, well, what is this? That's something that we really like to know about. Um, we, we grow by critiques. And if you know of a standard that's better, if you know that, hey, look, the community all use this standard of classification, we'd love to know that because a lot of us are managing ontologies that extend beyond our core expertise. And if users uh, keep us sharp, we really, really appreciate that. So do talk to us, and that's what makes these community ontologies. Thanks a lot to the speakers who have delivered a very quality presentations to us. Thanks. Well, thank you, by the way, for the opportunity. I really thank you. All.